Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Connecting Caregivers Conference with me, Linda Burhans, the gal who cares for the caregivers with love, laughter, and lessons learned. You know, I have a whole bunch of that stuff. We have three days packed with fabulous speakers, um, great sponsors. I'm so grateful to every single person that is part of this conference. And you don't hear, need to hear too much more from me because you'll hear from me later. So we're going to kick it off with our keynote speaker, Dr. Tam Cummings. Dr. Cummings is the author of Untangling Alzheimer's. Um, she's a gerontologist. She's fabulous. She's just the brains behind everything. So take it away, Tam. So Tam, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself while he's pulling that up. I'm a gerontologist. And you've been doing this for how long? 28 years. 28 years. Where are you located? I live in Pearl, Texas, which is halfway between Peabody and Permila on the other side of Ireland at Isora. But if you get to Ferry and Cranfields Gap, you've simply gone too far north, turn around and come back south. <laughs> I live halfway between Austin and Fort Worth, 60 miles west of Waco. Wow. In the middle of nowhere. I am a ninth generation Texan, so uh, I'm going to try to speak quickly today <laughs> so that I don't drag y'all down with a draw. All right. Okay, who, whoever is host needs to make me the host. I understand that. I don't know what the problem is. Okay, do you want me to um, disconnect and come back in? Would that help, or are we looking for something else? I bet it worked perfectly yesterday, didn't it? Yes, absolutely perfectly. <laughs> he's in the other room, and he's looking for it, he said. Uh, it says, we've got a note from Mary. It says, look for security. This is why they don't ever let me do this part, Linda, because I would just disconnect everybody and then set off things. Yeah, that's that's why I have people here helping me because, oh, it scares me all. <laughs> it scares me all. I remember when I started my very first radio show and it was the very first day. So it's like it goes on at noon. It was like two minutes to 12 and the power went out in the station. <laughs> oh, and, and the sweat is just coming down the sides of my head slowly but surely and I'm like oh my goodness oh it looks like we're doing the host now yes you got it girlfriend oh look at us here we go oh boy oh boy oh boy all right we're about to be there da, da, da. Oh, I feel good about it now. Here we are. Are you ready to Yay. go, Linda? Are you ready to go, everybody? We're ready. Finally, people are going, well, finally, we're ready to go. We had time to go get another cup of coffee while we were waiting for all of this. Okay, so, Linda, just want to thank you, all the work you do, you and your team and your friends and just the, the group you've built down there. You do one of the most amazing things. I go around the country. I don't run into people like you. You are just a blessing to folks who are dealing with somebody with dementia or even folks who might have dementia themselves. So thank you, Linda, for all you're doing. I'm so excited that your dream of having a big virtual conference is here. Um, of course, without COVID, this might've never happened. I mean, this is one of the good things is we're able to have conferences and bring people in and um, allow them to do this over several days because of the amount of information you're giving. And wow, that wouldn't have been possible before. So <clears throat> what I'm gonna talk about today, um, Linda, is self-compassion and compassion fatigue. And at the end, I am gonna send you guys uh, some information on uh, guilt, on grief, on self-compassion, I'm gonna send you the compassion fatigue test. I'm gonna send you multiple burden interview scales that allow family caregivers to grade themselves to see how high their stress level is. And those things are very important just because we are finally accepting, Linda, and I know that you've known this for a while, I figured it out a while ago, 
It is finally be accept, being accepted in our community that family caregivers do develop compassion fatigue. And that is a very serious thing. Its medical name is secondary traumatic stress disorder. And we'll come to that first, but let's talk about self-compassion, the things that we are doing for ourselves. And the first thing I wanna give you, and this is gonna come in your handouts too, Linda, and this is especially helpful because this is an at-home conference. You know those days, Linda, where everything's gone wrong and you are overwhelmed. You've got way too much on your plate. You've got way too much on your mind. And you literally reach a point where your brain feels like it's stuck. Well, computers have been designed to operate the way, the way, the way that we believe brains uh, function. So your brain opens a window and then opens another window and then you think about something with your loved one and another window opens and then you start thinking what if, what if, and that opens up a whole bunch of more windows and all of a sudden you find that you are stuck. You literally can't think of another thing and you don't know what to do yet. So this is called Greenstone's Awesome Icebreaker and I encourage you to use this every time you start to feel yourself overwhelmed. I have people tell me they've had to do this multiple times a day. This is a very easy thing to do. And the reason it works is the ice in your hand is going to tell your brain something is happening and it needs to shut down all of its windows and come back to its baseline of monitoring the body systems and functions. So all you're going to do is get a piece of ice, uh, put it in your hand and wrap your hand tightly around it. You shouldn't be holding it. You should be squeezing it. Shut your big old eyes and begin to take deep breaths through your nose only. And your brain will stop spinning around because your brain's now got something else to do. It's got to figure out what is going on. And the ice that you put in your hand is now freezing and burning and wet and dripping and your brain says, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do, but this is terrible. And it begins to shut down all those windows. And Linda, in about 45 seconds, you will be completely calm. And it is a tremendously powerful thing that we are able to do this and are able to do this quickly uh, to help you get calmed down. So Greenstone's awesome icebreaker. Print it out, put it on your fridge. I am going to send uh, Linda the PowerPoints and I am going to send you a handout which lists Greenstone's Awesome Icebreaker as one of your ways to quickly calm down. I use this at in-person conferences, Linda. We give out uh, cups of ice and napkins before people even sit down. And then we do this trick for about 45 seconds and it will calm you down and it'll help you as a family caregiver get ready for what is coming next. So does that make sense, Linda? I'm gonna ask you this about a thousand times today. If I got you and you're following me, then I figure everybody else is following me too. So I Greenstone's awesome icebreaker will literally save your life. Now for caregivers, does this picture look familiar? Is this what you were looking like and feeling like? And that was before COVID happened. Self-compassion is something that is, is actually very difficult for us to do. And it, it has to do with, we're good with compassion. Um, compassion means to suffer together. It has a deep evolutionary background. It comes from when we lived in tribes and large families. And when one of the members of our tribe was, was in danger, when they didn't feel right, the entire tribe came together to try to help this person. And so compassion is when you are motivated to do something to help somebody suffering. It's not empathy. Empathy is a skill that you and I practice so that we can put ourselves in another person's place so that we can help understand what it is they're feeling right now. Compassion happens when we actually um, feel empathy, but we also have a desire to help others. Find where my clicker went here. Now, compassion, when we feel compassion, Linda, it causes all kinds of things to happen. It releases our bonding hormone. So it makes our brain immediately feel better. That's why you do physically feel better when you reach out and help someone that you know is having some issues. The heart rate of you and I, as we feel compassion, our heart rate begins to come down, our blood pressure begins to change, and lobes of the brain actually light up in the pleasure centers of the brain. 
Um, normally people think this only happens if I'm doing something woohoo fun, but to just show compassion to another literally makes you and I feel better. And self-compassion is a big step, Linda. A lot of us are good with compassion. We feel compassion for others, but self-compassion means learning now to treat yourself with the same compassion that you would give to other people, including total strangers and maybe even your in-laws. And Linda, I put that in because my mother-in-law was the meanest woman I ever met in my life. I really had to think about compassion every time I was around her. Now, there's reasons we don't like compassion, believe it or not. Um, it can make us feel like we're needy and we're weak. Um, it may feel like we're not worthy of compassion. And that part comes from, believe it or not, Linda, and I know you know this, we are all much more familiar with that self-criticizing voice that we begin to hear as a young person, as a teenager, as a young adult, we begin to get a message or an actual person telling us, we're just not that good. We're just not that good of a person. We, um, what can happen in families is something you did because of an adolescent brain that was just really not a smart thing to do. That can end up being how your family looks at you and how your family believes you are and they don't accept that you've moved beyond that. Your brain is matured. What you did was a foolish thing of childhood. And so it's not at all unusual that a lot of us feel internally flawed because we are so familiar with listening to this voice telling us that we're just really not a good person when in reality they are. Some of you have trouble with regular compassion, and then we've all met this guy. He's suspicious of why you would want to be helpful. Uh, he worries that other people aren't really being genuine, genuine with him. He, he thinks that maybe you're really trying out to, to you're, you're figuring out some way to, to get him. People have a fear in our country of being dependent, of asking for help. That's not part of the American culture. And so the idea itself of being kind to yourself can make someone actually frightened by those emotions. You may not even recognize that you need self-compassion. And Linda, that can happen from that critical voice of telling me that I'm not a good person and that I'm not accountable for anything and that no one really cares about me and that um, my life is terrible. And all of those things are things that we feel, those are normal human things to feel but we also have to back up and realize what reality is. And the reality is for most of us, Linda, we're doing the best we can right now with what we know. And as we learn better, we do better. So one of the things I get a lot of feedback about is that I told a family something that was really hard for them to hear, but they now they know they need to hear it. Or I told a family something and they realized they, they were doing care in a way that we don't do care like that for somebody and they begin to feel guilty about it. Everybody out there is really doing the best job they can at the time with what they know. Self-compassion means to approach and understand and engage in your own suffering, but without blaming yourself. It means self-nurturing yourself. Now, Linda, self-nurturing does not mean we're all going to a bar later and having a bunch of drinks. That's oh. not the self nur I know, darn it. I heard I heard Donna just now go, darn it. I could feel people <laughs> going, rat, rat. I thought that's what we would do. It means that we that we practice acts of kindness for ourselves. And and sadly, beer, wine, and alcohol don't count. It is more specific things that you and I do. The original self-compassion is something we were born with. We begin to suck our thumb. That was our original self-compassion. When we felt that something around us wasn't right, and Linda, that could be that we felt the stress of our parents can mm -hmm. make us do this. So self-compassion originally was something we did ourselves, and some of us even started very early. This is a picture of a fetus in utero sucking his thumb. I think this is now a rap star, but I can't prove it. But I, I'm suspicious <laughs> of that. Then your next nurturing came from your mother, from your father. 
from your grandparents, your aunts and uncles, and you begin to climb up in people's laps and people were so delighted to hold you. Oh, you were adorable, Linda. You were fabulous. And we loved you and look at your pretty hair and look at your big old eyes and oh, you look like grandma and you're my favorite and you're the best. And then all of a sudden you got to weigh in 40 pounds. And then you got to be in 50 pounds and at 50 pounds, well, in Texas, that's a sack of cow feed. That's a lot of weight. And all of a sudden, you didn't get held in a lap anymore. All of a sudden, you went from being a little human being that got cuddled and held and felt love to get out of my lap. You're too big. And that is a big striking period for humans. That's a big change to go from... The first five years of my life, everybody's wanted to hold me, pick me up, squeeze me, carry me around, uh, play with me to all of a sudden get off my lap. You're too big. And that is a sudden jar. Hmm. And so now as we go through self-compassion today and compassion fatigue, Linda, we got to learn some breathing techniques. One of the things that is going to save us, especially you caregivers, is learning to do meditation and learning to do breathing meditation. And as we go through today, I'm gonna to stop and ask you to do some breathing. And the breathing we're gonna do is different, Linda. I'm gonna ask you to breathe in to the count of four, hold your breath to the count of two, and breathe out to the count of six. The out breath must be longer than the in breath in order for your body to slow down your breathing. You and I normally breathe 13 to 14 uh, reps per, per minute. We want to get you down to eight. When we get you down to eight breaths per minute, you are now either in prayer state or meditative state. And this is an excellent thing to do for your brain. This is thought to be the number one brain thing we can do as we age. Now, Linda, this doesn't work on our loved ones who have dementia because they have a disease that's destroying their brain. But for you and I, meditation needs to be a daily part of our uh, self-care. And if you're sitting here right now at Linda's conference going, huh, I know how to breathe. I don't need to do that. It means you need to be doing it twice a day. That's sort of the rule of thumb. So right now, I want everybody to put your feet flat on the floor, hands up in your lap, just gently resting in your lap. You can shut your eyes because I can't see you anyway. And I'm going to count for you, and we're going to do four breaths. We're going to breathe into the count of four, hold for two, breathe out to the count of six. Breathe in and out through your nose, Linda, because if you blow out through your mouth, you're just going to make your mouth dry. So when you're doing this uh, breathing technique, try to remember to breathe in only through your nose. Also, Linda, a trick of meditative breathing. On your first breath, your brain is going to say, well, this is stupid. I know how to breathe. And on your second breath, you're going to think, I need to go feed the dog. And on your third breath, you're going to think, again, I know how to breathe and I, I better go make sure I've changed the oil in my car. And on your fourth breath, so every breath, your brain is going to try to take you off to something else. Just tell your brain to come back to breathing because that's all we're going to do. So feet flat on the floor, hands up in the lap, deep breath in, two, three four, hold, hold, breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, deep breath in, two, three, four, hold, hold, breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, deep breath in, two, three, four, hold, hold, Breathe out, two, three, four, five, six. Last time, deep breath in, two, three, four, hold, hold. Breathe out, two, three, four, five, six. Now, Linda, a couple of tricks about breathing. If I'm feeling overwhelmed, I can just sit here in my chair and breathe. But if I'm starting to feel really overwhelmed, I can lay down on the couch or lay down on the bed and breathe. And that will also help to calm me down just because I've changed the way I'm looking at the world. And that 
simple technique of changing how we're sitting to a laying position will help us calm down. And as dementia caregivers, that's critical that we can do. So it's always going to be in and out through the nose, breathe into the count of four, hold to two, breathe out to the count of six. Linda, when you do that for 10 repetitions, you're now technically meditating. You just got to keep your brain coming back to, to breathing. Now, this daily look in the mirror may kind of feel normal to some of y'all. This may feel how the day starts for everybody. Oh, my God, it's here again. And what we want to do is think about ways to get around that. So when I began to realize this was happening to me, I called my friend Amy, the therapist, and Amy, the therapist, sent me to Pam, the therapist, and Pam told me I needed to get some self-compassion. And I thought, okay, great. Where do I get self-compassion? What does that mean? And she said, oh, it means you face your fear, but in a kind and gentle way. And my fear feels like a bear coming at me. And so how do I face that in a kind and gentle way? And Pam, the therapist, sent me to Dr. Kristen Neff's website. Dr. Neff is a professor at the University of Texas in Austin, and she is one of the leading researchers on self-compassion. Her website is self-compassion.org. And when you go to self-compassion.org, Linda, you're going to scroll all the way down to the bottom. And at the bottom... Dr. Neff has about a five-minute test for you to take that instantly scores you, so you can do it on your phone, on your iPad, on your computer. It instantly scores you and tells you whether or not you are practicing self-compassion. And, and what you're going to be amazed about, Linda, is that a lot of us think we're being kind to ourselves, and by Dr. Neff's measurements, we're not doing a very good job of practicing self-compassion. And since we want to be the survivors of dementia, remember the dementia caregiver death rate before COVID was two out of 10 caregivers die first. With COVID, it's now estimated that three out of 10 family caregivers die first. So when I talked to Pam, the therapist, and she sent me to Dr. Neff's website, and Dr. Neff said, be, be kind to yourself, and, and here was this bear looking at me, I thought, well, how is that going to help? And then I read, Dr. Neff says, this is a moment of suffering, and suffering is part of life. May I be kind to myself in this moment, in this moment right now, Linda, when my loved one is declining, when I am scared about what the future holds, when I, I feel like my children aren't involved, when whatever it is that's going on around us is going on, may I give myself the compassion I need. May I remember that I'm doing the best I can right now with what I know and that I am doing a good job as a caregiver. I'm doing what could easily take 12 people or more to do as their full-time jobs. And that's what's happening if your person is in stage five of the disease, you're exhausted because you're doing the care that's now required in a community because your loved one's needs have become medical needs. But for you and I, Linda, we've got to remember that for us to survive, we have to be gentle with ourselves. So let's all take a deep breath right now, Linda, just one deep breath, deep breath in, two, three, four, Hold, hold, breathe out, two, three, four, five, six. And Linda, now I want everybody listening to write three kind and supportive things that you would say to a friend who's hurting, to a friend right now in your shoes, going through what your day is. I want you to write down three kind things you would say to that friend that's hurting. And when you finish writing down three kind things, I want you to write down two things you would do physically to show your support for a friend. And probably, Linda, on the physical things, it's also going to involve I might have a mask on just because I want to be careful. So three kind and supportive things you would say to a friend who's hurting. And then two things you would do physically. 
Linda, one of the things I would do physically to show support for a friend, I just might put my arm around them. Mm -hmm. I might just give them a hug. Yes. What are three things you would say to be helpful and supportive? Because I saw you writing, Linda, so I know <laughs> you did it. What are three things you would say? I am here for you. That's a powerful thing. Um, know that you're not alone and that there is help. Again, good stuff. Good and please, stuff. And please just know that you are loved. Very important that you are loved. Or you might have said something like, you're going to get through this. We're going to get through this. Yes. We're all going to be here with you and we are going to support you as you go through this. So think about those things that you would do and then think about doing that for yourself. As you look at this today, complete this sentence. My purpose is. Linda, my purpose in life is to learn about dementia and teach it to other people. That is what my purpose is. That is the reason I am alive. That's what I was put on this earth to do. My purpose is to help others understand dementia, whether they're a family caregiver or whether they're a professional caregiver. My passion, Linda, is people with dementia. I am fascinated by what's going on with their brain and how can I find a better way to help communicate with them and to help give them better care. And I persist because I must. I, this is what I'm supposed to do. So Linda, what is your purpose? I know it has something to do with helping caregivers. I'm pretty sure. Well, I am the gal who cares for the caregivers with love, laughter, and lessons learned. Because I just And your like, passion? My passion is finding a better way for caregivers. And you persist because? Because I love people and I love caregivers and I just want to honor them. And I, I think you do that. So everybody complete these sentences. It will make you realize what you're doing counts, what you're doing matters. I'm aiming for global. I want everybody to understand this. Linda's yeah. aiming for everybody who can get to her show, everybody that she can reach out and touch by that. And you yourself may be persisting because of the love and care you feel for this person. Now, when I think about family caregivers, Linda, this tends to be the words that I think about. I think about people who are trustworthy, yeah. compassionate. People who educate themselves about dementia. This isn't a fun disease to learn about, especially when it's affecting your loved one, but you continue to learn everything you can. Dementia caregivers are fearless. I have seen caregivers get right up in a doctor's face and demand that they get the care that their loved one deserves. We're driven, we're honorable, we're forgiving. One of the big things we've got to remember to forgive, Linda, is ourselves. Yes. You and I only do the best we can each moment with what we know. And when we learn better, we do better. Amen. Loving. I have met the most loving people in the world. I have met siblings who have done everything they can to support and help their parents and to support and help themselves. And we all realize there's some imperfection in there, but we are human. Right. The key. To self-compassion, though, Linda, is how would I take these same words and treat a friend? And then can I turn around and recognize that I myself am in this same boat and deserve this same amount of compassion and care? So I want to teach you some things that we call compassionate touch. And Linda, these are other tricks that very quickly calm us down. So everybody put your hands on the face. Let me move my microphone so I don't. Just the act of doing this, Linda, it shows you make you feel different. Hold your face to what you do the way you were a child. It's going to be different. Just by simply doing it. Now, put your hand over your heart, Linda. 
That helps calm us down. Place your hands over your stomach. <sighs> the vagus nerve connects our brain to our heart, to our stomach, to our upper and lower digestion. And when the vagus nerve gets them unhappy, Linda, then our heart begins to pound, our blood pressure begins to go up, our stomach begins to get churny, 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 and then we get diarrhea. And we don't realize these things are all connected. So if I calm my vagus nerve by putting my hand over my face, my heart, and my stomach, I calm myself down just by using compassionate touch. Remember, you can lay down on the ground, on the floor or the bed and look up. That will give you a different view. Also, Linda, rub your forearms. We're not getting much touch because of COVID. And by simply rubbing your forearms, human skin has to be touched. By just rubbing your forearms, you will calm yourself and help yourself feel better. Hug yourself. Linda, big hug for yourself especially for all that you have done today. Everybody who's got up early to be part of this, who's going to do this for the next several days, hug yourself. Go back to your hands on your face. And then a little lady told me once, she had dementia. She said the way you get through every day is you stop for a moment and you dance like nobody's watching. Now, Linda, I did not tell anybody to go to a dark, smoky bar. You are my witness on that. I simply said, dance like no one's watching. Look, I even found some monsters practicing self-care. Look at them with their hands over their hearts trying to feel better. So anyone could do it. So we were beginning to, self, to, to do self-compassion, but then came COVID-19. And just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, it did. So Pam, the therapist, told me that she added more stuff to her daily routine to prepare for COVID. So I did too. I begin to add an additional meditation. Now, in your handouts that we're going to send you, you've got a whole handout just on stress relievers, stress relievers. And some of you meditate in different ways. Some of you meditate by gardening. Some of you meditate by music. Some of you meditate cooking is a meditation for some people. Some of you have meditation or adult coloring books. And because everything has to be colored in in such tiny amounts, it causes your brain to slow down. It causes your breathing to slow down. Had to add exercise, Linda. We got to get out. We got to move our body. We don't move the way our grandparents did. It's estimated we're moving 80% less than our grandparents. And even a few minutes outside lowers your blood pressure. So when you're outside and you're doing your exercise, even if it's just walking down the sidewalk to the mailbox and back, stop and try to focus on something. Focus on a tree, but don't just look at the tree, Linda. Look at the bark on the tree. Look at the leaf on the tree, the veins on the leaf of the tree. Learn mindfulness and remember to breathe into four, hold to two, out to six and then sleep. Linda, we can't practice self-compassion. We cannot be good caregivers when we are too exhausted to do care. We can be so exhausted, we can't do compassion for others. We can't have empathy for others. And that means we certainly can't have empathy for ourselves. Try mindfulness a meditation that you can find on YouTube. It's free. There are two to four hour mindful meditation, relaxation things that you can get there. And the one I like is called the Mindfulness Institute, I believe. And the lady's name is Sarah Rayburn, and she will talk you to sleep. And Linda, when COVID started, when conferences begin to cancel, that's how I make my living. And all of a sudden I watch my living disappearing. I begin to have some serious issues with sleep. And I've always had insomnia just as a present from my mother and grandmother. I got insomnia. I probably spent six months every single night listening to Sarah Rayburn talk me to sleep. And it helped. 
and now I don't have to use that, and now I'm able to go back to a regular sleeping pattern. But last week, I was teaching in a community, and I asked the professional caregivers, how many of you are having trouble sleeping? And three quarters of them raised their hands. We know that this is a mental health issue. We know that this is a health issue. You have got to make sure that you're getting sleep. Remember to ignore those uh, old critical you that you hear about. Go on YouTube, find meditation. Everybody can get free meditation on YouTube. Go to Deepak Chopra, go to therapy in a nutshell. I love therapy in a nutshell, Linda. In 10 to 15 minutes, she gives you actual nuggets that you can use to help with your anxiety, with your depression, with what you're feeling right now. And she, her YouTube is also on a podcast if you'd rather do podcasts. But I have to tell you, when I found therapy in a nutshell, I almost told Pam, the therapist, I don't need you anymore. I got therapy in a nutshell <laughs> and she's free, but I kept it up. Journal. And when you journal, not only journal what's happening, but also every day, add in three things you're grateful for. If you do that every day, Linda, within two weeks, inflammation in your body will begin to reduce. So recognizing the things that we're thankful for every day are also self-compassion. They're also very helpful to us. I have a, a sign on the wall I look at every night right before I fall asleep. And it says, what if you woke up tomorrow with only the things you were grateful for today? So every day I do my, great, my gratitude prayers. Throw out that old family dialogue. There's the family you're born with and the family you choose. The family you're born with is full of nothing but critical for you. Call Linda. Talk with Linda. Linda will help you find some new friends, friends that will support you. Do reality checks. Linda, I was having a day one day so bad. I, I was so overwhelmed. I called my therapist. She called me back about 10 minutes later and I said, oh, I'm so sorry I bothered you. I don't need you. And she said, well, you just called me. What, what's going on and what happened now that you don't need me? And I said, well, I needed you when I called you. But then I passed a car wreck where a man was being cut out of his car with the jaws of life. So you know what? My little problem right now isn't nearly as big. So do reality checks. Listen to music, but listen to music you like. Don't listen to music you don't like. That doesn't help. And watch comedy. Stay away from the news. It's not going to be helpful. If this is the way you're feeling, ah, I got to be perfect. I'm not good enough. I can't make a mistake. That, that's just not reality. We, we're all good enough. We all make mistakes. That's how we learn. And you are so so worthy. You are doing some incredible care. So remember to be kind to yourself versus self-judgment. Remember what you're doing today, who you really are versus those old messages about yourself. Remember common humanity versus being isolated. Be mindful of what's going on and treat yourself the way you would treat others. Use your reality checks there but for the grace of God. And Linda, I'm probably going to be the only one to give your, your conference homework, but your homework today is to write a letter to yourself. And it should start with dear, extraordinary, special, wonderful self. Write a letter about all the things you've done for your loved one, all the things that you have done to help others. Write a letter about a, what a good, kind, loving person you are, and then read that letter to yourself. And when the day is hard, and Linda and I will both tell you hard days are coming, when those days are hard, get that letter out and read it, because you have done an extraordinary job. Thank yourself for being a person who cares, for stepping forward to protect someone, for your due diligence, for your patience, for all the things that you do. Some of you do this while you balance a career. Some of you may have left your career, but what you have done matters. 
And remember, at the same time, you're still a good friend, a good colleague, a good spouse, a good parent, a good child, and a good caregiver. You show up every single day. You help others. And some of you are funny. You make us laugh when we talk about you. Just one more thing. Remember to give yourself that hug. Remember to hug you the way you would hug somebody else. All right, now, Linda, we have only a few minutes left, but let's go through self, um, let's go through compassion fatigue very quickly. Compassion fatigue is not burnout. Burnout means I need a weekend off. I need to come visit y'all. I need to go to the beach. Y'all need to make me one of those fancy drinks and a coconut with all that stuff and a little umbrella. Compassion fatigue is actually a medical disease called secondary traumatic stress disorder. It is not primary stress dis traumatic stress disorder because you and I are not the person with the illness. But the very act of being the caregiver for someone with a terminal illness is that this person begins to be affected by overwhelming emotional exhaustion that begins to take a physical toll on you. Some of you are in denial, Linda. And you're going to say, I don't have it. And I'm going to say back to you, maybe you do. And these are some of the issues. Um, it can be you're doing caregiving 24-7, 365. It can be that your family is just crazy. Can't get them to understand what's going on. You're doing work and care and work and care and work and care and work and care. One of the biggest complaints, Linda, is families who take their loved one to a doctor and the doctor doesn't acknowledge their loved one. There can be family issues that have been going on for years. How many of us, Linda, have found out that we've got a sister that's been mad at everybody for 50 years for something that happened in junior high? None of us even knew about it. So understand you're feeling very real things. And on top of this, as a family caregiver, you've also got a heapy helping dosing of guilt. And Linda, I'm going to send you a handout on guilt and grief. And one side of the page is the guilt and grief that the family caregiver feels if they are an adult caregiver based on the stage of dementia their loved one is in. The other side of the page is going to tell you if you are the spousal caregiver, the kind of grief and guilt you would normally be feeling based on the stage your loved one's in. So we know you've got guilt. And you need to be aware that this is coming. Is this how you felt? If this is how you felt this morning, like your hair is always on fire and you're having trouble with all of these, and look at the last one, concentration. When we are dementia family caregivers and then we have trouble concentrating, never, Linda, has someone come to me and said, I'm having trouble concentrating. I may have secondary traumatic stress disorder, but I've had an awful lot of them come to me and go, I'm not concentrating. I bet I got it too. You don't have dementia. You have exhaustion. Now, to deal with um, compassion fatigue, Linda, there's some questionable coping methods that people use, and we've been studying them. Um, these are actually three of my nieces. They're at Texas <laughs> A&M. Yeah, we're deeply ashamed. Um, they kept telling my mother they were at the library studying with Jack and Jim, and nobody told my mother there's a bar at A&M <clears throat> called the library, and this is the study, and that was going on. So you're shopping to try to help yourself feel better. The problem is you're not really wanting what you're buying and then the bill is going to come. If you're smoking, you may have increased your smoking. If you're drinking, you may have increased your drinking. By the way, during COVID, the state of Texas is leading the nation in drinking. So that's something we're kind of proud of, but it's not good for us. And then sex means you're having sex with someone that you shouldn't be having sex with. So these are normal methods people use to try to cope with compassion fatigue. We have this guy, he isolates and blames. It's hard to find him. And when you do find him, he's mad at everybody. We have this person, they don't show up for work. They uh, just sort of hide from everything that's going on. And remember, Linda, sometimes adult children are doing this because the parent who's doing care hasn't given them jobs to do. Your children are afraid of you. 
I'm 60 years old and I can promise you, I'm still afraid of my parents. If they tell me to jump, I just start jumping. I don't ask how high. Give your children things to do to help, even if it means sending food to you. And then some of you are this. And Linda, we have seen this over and over again. And this person says to us, you're not going to take care of my loved one the way I do. And our answer is you're absolutely correct. We will never do care in our communities the way you do care at home. But here's what we do do. We come in fresh and rested every eight hours. There's an entire team of us who are trained in dementia care and medical care to help do the care for your loved one. None of us are mad about something that happened 50 years ago to your loved one. And none of us are waiting for your loved one to die so we can get our hands on some money. So you're right. You're absolutely right. We will never do care exactly the way you do, but we will do professional care. We will do medical care. We will do consistent care all the way to the end of life. Let's all take a deep breath, Linda. One deep breath in, two, three, four, hold, hold, breathe out, two, three, four, five, six. Now, things that you can do, you can mentor someone else. Learn mindfulness, practice meditation, and practice taking care of yourself. Things that you can't do, you can't ignore it. You can't pretend it's going to go away on its own. You can't stop nurturing yourself and you can't expect others to fix it. I am going to send Linda the official compassion fatigue test. This test has a 98% validity rating on it, meaning you cannot fool it. It is going to measure you for burnout, for compassion satisfaction, meaning you're good where you are, or for compassion fatigue. If you fail and hit compassion fatigue numbers, you need to go see your physician because this is a medical illness called secondary traumatic stress disorder. Remember to breathe. Remember the only person you can actually control, Linda, is you. Remember in this moment right now, your loved one is safe. Everybody around you, professional caregivers, we're doing the best we can. So are you. Turn off the news. The news has been designed to hit you like bullets. It's meant to be staccato. And Linda, have you learned anything in the news today that wasn't just as bad as it was yesterday? That wasn't just as bad as it was a year ago? It's the same news every day. It's all bad. Use your icebreakers. Add daily things to your list of stuff to do that allow you to calm yourself down. Add that daily walk, even if it starts with just stepping outside and taking a few breaths. And then remember, meditation will save your life and save your brain. Empower yourself. Remember prayer, gratitude, blessings. Do a reality check. In this moment right now, Linda, I am safe. In this moment right now, you are safe. Our loved ones are safe. Reinforce relationships with family if you can. Set up Zoom, set up Skype, set up FaceTime calls with your loved one. Do a good deed. Stay focused on the positive. And remember, even if your loved one is in a community, they're still getting great care. And we will get through this. We come from a long line of good stock. So self-compassion.org, go on Kristen Neff's website, take the test, and then get yourself some of that. And Linda, do you remember cell phones? They came out in 2007. They were going to be so helpful. They haven't been helpful. Learn to turn your phone off. But oh my God, tell your family first or they will call the police to come to your house because oh my God, grandma hadn't answered the phone. Ah, Just tell them you're taking a break. You don't need to talk to anyone right now. For those of you who are being a friend, remember that you're going to have to be able to accept intense emotions 
and you're going to have to accept those by simply being able to listen. Being a good friend in dementia care means being comfortable with just the silence and being comfortable with crying. Remember, you don't have all the answers, but hold on to encouragement, to a kind word, and send cards. Cards and letters mean so much more to us than a text message or even a phone call because it's something that we can hold on to. And finally, Linda, this is a technique we use when we have just reached the end of our rope. And this usually has to do with anger being built up inside of us. And it is normal for us to feel anger about this disease, anger about retirement, anger about the cost of care, anger that this is what happened. And so simply turn on the shower, turn on the television, put the dogs in another room. Don't do it in public. You will scare children. People will call for help for you. But simply wrap a dishcloth, bite it, and scream as loud and as long as you can. And Linda, try to stay focused on the anger in you before you let yourself start crying. A lot of times I see family caregivers, they say, I can't cry because if I start cry, I won't. Stop. Yes, you will. And when we cry grief tears, those are different then I stubbed my toe tears. If I do the screen technique, Linda, I make sure I do it at night because it's typically going to be exhausting because I'm going to get out all of that anger and fear and frustration I have in me and my throat's going to hurt. So I'm going to have a warm cup of tea, a bubble bath, and then I'm going to go to bed because I've tried to get it all out. Remember what the dignity of life is that you and I want respect from one another the dignity and dementia is that we want the same. But for you, you've got to respect. You're giving great care or you have already given wonderful care. And when it is time to turn your loved one over to professional caregivers, because dementia is a real brain disease, it requires 24-hour medical care by stage five of the disease, it will take an entire team of us to do what you have been doing alone. So you are amazing. Hang in there. Enjoy your conference. And I hope you all have a really, really wonderful conference and take back all sorts of fabulous information. And then, of course, I'm going to send you 9 million handouts. <laughs> that's what I like to do. All right, Linda, do you, have any, do you have any questions? No, we're fabulous. Thank you so much for all this information. I mean, we just... It's such a beautiful way to start the conference. The caregivers realizing they need to care for themselves. And it's great to see you. And thanks for all the presentations you bring to the public. And um, I look forward to seeing you live. Thank you, Linda. And I'll see you guys next week. Everybody take care and enjoy your conference. So this uh, portion of our conference was brought to you by Arden Courts, where all they do is memory care. And we're going to hear a little uh, commercial from Arden Courts right now. Arden Courts is not just a place to live. It's a place to call home. Residential living combined with quality caregiving. This is the philosophy behind Arden Courts. Communities created exclusively for individuals with Alzheimer's disease and related dementia who would benefit from a safe and structured environment. For additional information about any of the unique services Arden Courts provides, call 888-478-2410 to locate a community nearest you. Inquire about our educational seminars, resource library, or support groups, or simply feel free to ask questions you may have about Alzheimer's and related dementias. At Arden Courts, we know, we understand, and we can help because memory care is all we do. Remember, Call 888-478-2410 for additional information about any of the unique services Arden Courts provides. I'm very excited to, that everyone's here today. And I have a little prayer here that I would like to read because I think it's something that kind of follows in, in line with what Tam just said. And it's called the Caregiver Warrior Prayer. It says, please help me stay calm, patient, and kind. Please help me be my personal best. Please stop me from taking blame for things beyond my control or putting that blame on someone else. Give me grace under fire. 
Strengthen when I'm weary and courage when I'm scared. Give me the ability to stay in touch with the love that lies in my soul so I feel it for myself and spread to those who need it. Let me be grateful beyond measure for this day I have been granted so that I can make it the best of days. And I think just by being here today, you're making it the best of days um, because we're going to learn so many new things today. 